Hello. We've been talking about the development of these American colonies for some time now. And, um, you know, by the, by, by the dawn of the 18th century, uh, I think it's worth noting that most of your people in America thought of themselves as British citizens. I mean, they were across the Atlantic Ocean, but they were British citizens. One of the things that I really want to point out is that's going to begin to change here with this lecture, and you'll see why here momentarily. Um, when it comes to the 18th century, there's a lot of historians that describe it as a time period of war with sporadic outbursts of peace. Now, what they're saying is, generally speaking, this is a very violent century, and it's in particularly violent between the British and the French. Why is that? Well, part of this is something called the Great War for Empire. Both Britain and France were colonial powers, and as you might imagine, there were only so many col colonies to go around, and naturally both the French and the British wanted them. And so every once in a while you would see them go to war for colonies. Now this was very global in its scope, so I need you to understand it's happening in North America, but it's also happening in Asia, it's starting to happen in Africa, it's happening all across the world. In the North American context, what historians refer to this as is the French-Indian War. Now, on the surface level, this very much sounds like the French and the Native Americans are fighting. What we mean is the French and the Native Americans are generally fighting against the British. Not to say that the British did not have their Native American allies themselves, but in particular, the French had more Native allies. Why? Well, think back to New France. Think back to the French model as it relates to colonization. The king couldn't get too many Frenchmen to come over here and colonize the New World in New France the same way that the British couldn't stop it quick enough. I mean, there were so many British migrants that were land hungry that were wanting to come over here that you know, the floodgates just opened up. So anyway, if you're Native American and you're sizing up the situation, you clearly want the French to win because you have an upteen times greater ability to hold on to your land if the French win this thing because there simply just aren't as many of them as opposed to the British who not only have a tendency of bringing more people over but conquering more lands at the same time. Okay, So that's generally why it's called the French Indian War. Now, in terms of the North American context, I need you to understand that this war for empire was generally the brainchild of the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, their version of President guy by the name of William Pitt. Britain is a colonial country. It's a very powerful country, but it's also an island nation. And what that means is, if its industries are going to thrive, if its textile industry, if its metalworking industry is going to continue to dominate the world market, it needs a steady stream of natural raw material. Okay, And the best way to do that is to control the wealth of the world so that you have more colonies throughout the world to feed the industries of Great Britain. Okay, so that's the war that William Pitt is designing, and ultimately it's going to come to a head when it comes to conflict with France. All right. Now, I just mentioned the fact that the Native Americans generally sided with the French for really obvious reasons, and that put the British at a disadvantage. Well, one of the advantages that the British had going for them in 1754 was they might not have had as many Native American allies, but they sure had a whole lot of American colonists over here. And most of those colonists really did consider themselves to be British. And so what the Prime Minister does is he reaches out to colonial leaders and he asks them to if they, if they would be willing to join the British in their fight against the French. Now he said, look, I don't want you to answer right now. I want you to take your time on this. I want you to get together and discuss this as a group. All right? What I'm referring to is the Albany Congress of 1754. Now, the Albany Congress was important for a number of different reasons, but one of the most important reasons is this is the first time in American history that we really got together as a collective entity. In other words, there were representatives from Virginia and Massachusetts and New York, and you get the idea. And we all got together talking about a similar question, dilemma, I guess, if you will, whether or not we should join the British. Now, Benjamin Franklin really thought this was a great opportunity because 
this got everybody in the same room and got us talking and we began to talk about, you know, are we really British or are we becoming something else? But the other great significance of the Albany Congress is that it's the British that are essentially telling us, you don't actually have to do this. When, from a very technical standpoint, what the king could do is say, we're at war, I'm going to conscript you, I'm going to force you into the military, you're going to serve the interests of the British military. They're not doing that. And so what that is reinforcing in the minds of American colonists is our laws, our leaders, they take precedent. They come first, and it's the British that come second. And if we don't really want to do this, we don't have to. Well, ultimately, we decided that we wanted to participate in this because we looked at the West, which really was the jewel of the French Indian War. It's the French and the uh, native, excuse me, the French and the British fighting over the Ohio River Valley. And we said, there's great, valuable land out there, and we want it. And ultimately, at the Albany Congress, we decided that we would participate in the war. We did send not only resources, but we also sent our militias to participate. And as you'll find out, it's really the American colonists that begin to turn the tide in favor of the British. Now, one of the reasons we felt so adamantly that we should be involved in this war is this scouting military man by the name of George Washington. Washington had been born in the continental Americas, and that put him at a disadvantage when it comes to fulfilling his lifelong dream of being an official in the British military. He was a major in the colonial uh, Virginia Regiment, uh, the colonial militia, but because he was a colonial, in other words, he had not been born in Britain, he had not gone to military school in London, um, he was really thought of as a second-class citizen. So Washington, even though he had formal military training, was really seen as a guy that was just not quite good enough for the British regular military. And so he kind of grew up with a chip on his shoulder as such. Now, what does that have to do with the French Indian War? Well, it's Washington that the British government commissioned to kind of scout out, to go across the Appalachian Mountains and tell us what we're looking at with respect to all this land in the Ohio River Valley that the French were claiming too. Now, it's Washington that managed to get himself captured by the French in 17, seven, excuse me, 1753 in the aftermath of attacking the French fortifications in what is present-day Pittsburgh. Okay? It's also Washington that's going to play this very critical role in the coming of the French and uh, Indian War, considering it's one of the Native American allies under the command of George Washington that essentially assassinates a French diplomat. So a guy that really didn't have anything to do with this conflict that was erupting between Britain and France all across the rest of the world, let alone Europe, is really the guy that brings war between Britain and France to North America. It's George Washington. Now, it's also going to be Washington that's going to gain valuable military experience in this war. Um, from a technical tactical standpoint, we really don't have any what you would consider to be military officials. Washington's going to cut his military teeth in the experiences that he gains uh, in the French-Indian War fighting on behalf of the British. Okay. Now, the more and more you take me, the more and more you're going to understand I really don't do military history. Uh, I'm not very good at it. I don't have a great passion for it. So to that end, um, I'm going to skip over much of the Johnny Ran Up the Hill version of the French Indian War and cut straight to the chase, which is the British are going to win this thing. And one of the key factors in a British victory is the American colonial willingness to participate in the effort. We're really going to turn the tide, so to speak. Okay. Now, as far as the war is concerned, Britain is victorious, but one of the things that I need you to be mindful of, it takes on an awful lot of debt. Right? The British government is deeply, deeply, deeply in debt in the aftermath of the French Indian War. And we'll talk more about that in, a, in an upcoming lecture. But the spoils of the war. What the British were able to do was confiscate all the main holdings that the French had laid claim to up until this point, including the colony of Quebec, right? 
Now, Quebec was basically New France, and now it's going to be annexed by the British North American Empire. So the British are seeing real tangible results for their efforts here. The only problem is they've got a group of people, French colonists that is, that don't like them very much, are very suspicious of them, and would love nothing more than to return the favor and, you know, rebel if they could. So the British are going to be forced to leave their military there, which is going to be problematic for a number of different reasons. We'll get to that in an, uh, in an upcoming lecture. The other problem that they're going to have is they're going to have to find a way to raise some revenue, and one of the places that they're increasingly going to turn to is the American colonies. Now, if you follow closely in one of the previous lectures, I was talking about something called salutary neglect, the idea that the British saw us buying illegal tea, the British saw us not paying our taxes, or as, at least not as much as them as we should be, but they really didn't do much to enforce them. We were good for business, so they looked the other way. That's going to come to an end after the French-Indian War. Now, one of the reasons that we got into this fight in the first place, we being the colonials, got in the fight in the first place, was because we saw this land out west and we, we valued it, we wanted it. In the immediate aftermath of the war, there's some things that are happening that are going to put an end to that idea of us going out to the West and getting rich and making all this money. And one of the things that's going to end it is something called Pontiac's Rebellion. Now, Chief Pontiac was a Native American leader. He was also an official in the British military, or excuse me, the, um, the French military, that had a really big vested interest in seeing the French win this fight. And so when the French surrendered, one of the things that they said is, we're going to surrender all of our claims west of the Appalachian Mountains, the states that would eventually become Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, the upper Midwest. The French are basically handing that over to the British. Chief Pontiac says, look, you, you might have settled with your enemies, the French, but you have not settled with us. And so what Pontiac does is he puts together an inter-Native American resistance movement to the British coming out to the Midwest and settling what they considered to be Native American territories. Now keep in mind, one of the reasons that the Natives liked the French so much was even though they claimed the land, they really didn't try to possess and control the land. And here are all these British colonists that are coming in that are doing exactly that. So Pontiac's Rebellion, what I need you to know about this, is it's a coordinated Native American assault. It's not necessarily one tribe or even one nation. It's an inter-Native American effort to try to keep the British off of what they consider to be their ancestral homelands. Now, if you're Great Britain in 1763, when the war with the French ends, the very last thing in the world that you want to see is a renewed war especially with a determined, powerful enemy like these Native Americans. So in 1763, what they do is they issue something called the Proclamation of 1763. And what the Proclamation says is, there will be no British expansion into the Ohio River Valley. In other words, the British are going to forbid American colonists from expanding into the West and taking advantage of all that valuable farmland, which was what got us in the, the fight in the first place. So Pontiac's Rebellion is really important in the sense that, number one, the British have this agreement with the Native Americans that they're not going to colonize that part of North America. And even more importantly, one of the reasons that we got involved in the fight was we thought that we're going to get all this land, and now that's not going to materialize. So that really didn't set too well with us. For all intents and purposes, most colonists, I think if you could have asked them, they would have said to the British government, don't ask us for money because as far as we're concerned, we already fought your war, we helped to win your war, and you didn't even really pay us very fairly, okay? So anyway, I'm hopeful that you can kind of see what's getting ready to come down the pipe, okay? What's getting ready to come down is some conflict between Britain and the mother country, or excuse me, Britain and the colonial societies. Um, here we were thinking that uh, we had fought this good fight, and they asked us, they didn't tell us that we had to, and not only are we not going to get what we came for, i.e. the land, now, in the aftermath of 1763, they've got the audacity to tax us. So it was almost like a double slap in the face from that perspective. And that's where we'll pick it up the next time we get back into this.